Well, friends, we come to our reading and our sermon. Uh, We have a slight change in our service this morning, slight deviation uh, from our sermon series about the hand of God. Uh, Lloyd was going to be preaching about the hand of God in evangelism from Acts chapter 11, uh, but actually we have a change. Bishop Ruth has recorded a sermon for us based on the Old Testament lesson set for today. Uh, I hope that in due course she will come and preach for us here in Rudrick when uh, we're able to meet all together and and sing and get everyone in the building without social distancing. Uh, But until that time, it's a great way for us all to get to meet Bishop Ruth, to hear her preach uh, and to get to know her a little better. And so uh, we're going to have our Bible reading, which is from Exodus chapter 3. It's verses 1 to 15. If you've got a Bible to hand, do grab it. Uh, She's going to go through uh, this passage in sections, so it would be really helpful to have a Bible uh, with you as she does. And now uh, Louise and Grant are going to bring us our reading. Good morning. Today's reading is taken from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that although the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over to see this strange sight. Why does the bush not burn up? And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. He then said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying because of the slave drivers, and I am concerned for their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, Pezzarites, Hivites and Jezebites, and now the cry of the Israelites have reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your father has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you will say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning and hello. My name is Ruth Bushager and I am the new Bishop of Horsham. It's a great joy to join the Diocese of Chichester and it's wonderful to be joining you this morning at your church. And um, at this stage in the pandemic, I guess some of us will now be watching this sermon video alone at home others of you might be at home but watching with members of your own household or your social bubble and some of us are back into our church buildings and having perhaps a mixture of pre-recorded material and real life face-to-face worship whoever you are 
and however you're watching this and whatever you believe you are so welcome and I really pray that this passage from the Bible that we're going to be uh, reading this morning and looking at closely Exodus chapter 3 verses 1 to 15 I pray that this will be a great blessing to you as the living God speaks to us through his written word so today we read a very familiar story. It's got fire in it. It's one of the most famous chapters in the whole Bible, Moses and the burning bush. And we're going to go in sections through the passage. So if you can have a Bible open in front of you, please do, and you can read along with me. Let's set the scene for a minute. Moses was born around the end of the 14th century BC and he was born into a Hebrew family who were living in slavery in Egypt under great oppression and uh, the baby Moses was rescued from the Nile, the baby in the basket, rescued by the princess, the daughter of the Pharaoh. So Moses was raised in the palace of Pharaoh but he was not actually an Egyptian boy, he was a Hebrew. And one day, as an adult, he sees a Hebrew slave being beaten by an Egyptian. And in an act of great rage against that injustice, Moses kills the Egyptian slave driver. So then we have Moses the murderer running away into the desert where he finds a job as a shepherd. And he's there for 40 years. So at the end of Exodus chapter 2, we have a behind the scenes unveiling like the curtains of heaven are drawn back. And we see that now the God of compassion is on the move. And he has heard the cry of his people in slavery. He has seen their suffering. And in compassion, he is moving his plan to liberate them. And his first thing is to call his servant Moses to be his leader in this great mission of God to liberate his people. I have come down to rescue, says the Lord. And in this extraordinary scene that follows in chapter three, God calls Moses to lead that rescue plan. He's an 80 year old who spent his whole adult life hiding in the desert with a flock of sheep for company. I wonder if you're listening this morning and you're definitely in the second half of life, maybe even like Moses, You've been hiding somewhat from your past, perhaps retreating into your own, own wilderness years. I don't know if the months of COVID have felt a bit like wilderness years for you. It seems to have gone on for a long time. Maybe you've been laying low. Maybe you've been tending to a different job in life that you know deep down is not the calling of God. But in God's economy, wilderness is never wasted. So here we are in chapter three verses 1 to 3. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the far side of the wilderness. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Verse 2, there the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in flames of fire from within the bush. I don't have a bush, but we've got a campfire. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. The messenger of God appears to Moses in a bush that is on fire but doesn't burn. Now the story is commonly, famously called Moses and the burning bush. But actually it's Moses and the not burning bush. My wood is definitely burning up. Quite understandably, Moses is deeply curious and he's drawn in to an encounter, wanting more, curious. When the Lord saw, verse 4, that Moses had gone over to, the look, to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. God's rescue plan starts with a call. God calls Moses by name. His call is deeply personal, individual and specific. God's chosen servant is now ready to hear his life's mission. God calls Moses, Moses, and Moses' reply is, here I am. That's actually just one word in the Hebrew, hine. It's a word that a soldier might say when reporting for duty. Yes, sir, here I am. 
ready and able and willing for service, present for action. Yes, sir. Hine. I had a curate at my previous parish called Peter. And when the diocese rang to offer me this particular curate who I'd not met before, they said, he is very American. And indeed, he did turn out to be not just an American, but very American. And it was wonderful. From time to time, I would say Peter, and he would say, yes, ma'am. Hine, here I am. What do you want me to do? Reporting for action. And then God reveals important aspects to Moses of his own nature. Don't come any closer, God says, verse 5. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen, I have heard, and I care. So I have come down to rescue my people from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land and into a good and spacious land. Verse 10, so now go, Moses. I, the Lord, am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God is going to rescue his people. He promised he would, actually, way back with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. So this promise has been a long time coming. But now it's Moses' turn to step up. And Moses has first this revelation. What is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob like? What is the nature of this God who is speaking to me in this fire? The first thing Moses needs to know is that this God is a holy God. This is not just a holy moment. There is a sense of the dangerous present of a holy God revealing himself in fire. So Moses, take off your shoes. The second revelation is that God is not just holy, he's also compassionate. Now most of us listening this morning, perhaps we're a bit too familiar with the idea of a compassionate God. We should take note that our God is not like other gods, verse 7. The God of the Bible hears and remembers and sees and is moved to act. Not all gods are compassionate. Not all gods care for the suffering of people. The gods of Egypt that Moses knows very well, they do not care about the misery in human life. They cannot hear and remember and see and act. The gods of Canaan cannot help either. The modern gods, too, that we idolise and worship so much, they also have no regard for human suffering. Not materialism, or careerism, or fame, or wealth, or perfectionism, or popularity. They do not care. And what we read here in Exodus 3, 7, the God of Moses stands in contrast to the gods of this world, the gods of every age, in the face of suffering, and injustice. The God of Moses says, I have seen, I have heard, I care, I have come down to rescue. So verse 10, Moses, now go. Now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. That's the mission right there. The wholesale rescue of the whole people of God. This God is holy, he's compassionate, and he's in the business of liberation, of freedom for his people. Notice Moses' call is to go. It's ascending into action. It's got to involve movement. It must involve leaving. It must also mean loss. For Moses, it's actually a return, a return to his origins, a return to the home of the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh, a return to the royal courts where he ran freely in the corridors as a young boy and where he fled in shame and fear as a middle-aged man, a return to people who raised him, who he would now come up against in fierce confrontation. And it's a very, very daunting call. 
I wonder if you've ever felt daunted by a sense of the call of God over your life. Understandably, in verse 7, Moses says to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. This will be the sign to you that it's I who've sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. What a daunting task. And do you see how quickly Moses has gone from, yes, sir, hine, reporting for duty, here I am, to what, sir, me, sir, from here I am to who am I? Who am I? I'm just a, a washed up exile and refugee, tending sheep in the wilderness. I'm old, I've failed. The Egyptians won't receive me. The Israelites won't listen to me. Everything I'm, I've, I've ever done disqualifies me from following God's call on my life. Notice God's reply. God says, it's not about you, Moses. I am who I am. I have seen the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. I know all of you, and my call is about me, who I am. Who am I, we might ask. Every single Christian is called by God to partner with him in his rescue mission to the world that he loves so much. Each and every one of us, without exception, are invited to participate in this call to say yes, to be used by God for his purpose of salvation in the world. And every Christian who has ever heard this call correctly has been daunted by it and known self-doubt and fear. The answer is that it is not about us. It's about the one who calls us, the one who is with us. Moses asks, who am I? And the answer is, well, that doesn't really matter at all. Moses asks, who am I? And the answer is, well, that's the wrong question. Moses asks, who am I? And God doesn't answer that question at all. God replies, I will be with you. I will be with you. So Moses now wants to know the name, the name for God. He's familiar with all the Egyptian gods. Moses grew up learning about all of those in the Pharaoh's palace. But this God, the God in the fire who has called him to be a liberator. What is this God's name? And God said to Moses, verse 14, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God's answer, the I am in the Hebrew is higher, Asher, higher. And scholars have argued for years how to translate that. There are sort of three ways to interpret the name God gives for himself. One's from the verb I am. I am the one who is, says God. I am who I am. Or from the verb to be. I cause to be what I cause to be. Or from the future sense, I will be who I will be. Their name for the God of the Bible is that he is existence itself. He is being. He is creator and sustainer. He is reality. He is the one who is, was and always will be. He is past and present and future. He is the eternal one. So Moses, that's the one who's called you and sending you on this mission. He's the one who still today calls people to know him and to join in with his purposes in the world. The great I am, the one who is, was and always will be. Now only he, only a God for whom that is true, is the one true God. All the other gods, the gods of Egypt and Canaan and 21st century Britain, all the other gods are created, whether they're little stone statues with shrines or systems of thought or philosophies or ideals. They're the product of a disordered human longing and our own creativity. But this God, 
he is the only Lord. And he's going to be demonstrating that fact in astoundingly powerful ways in the chapters to come in Exodus. So do read on with the rest of your Sunday if you can, because it's a gripping story. But I wonder if there are some listening today who are sensing the call of God. It might be a call even to believe in him and trust him for the very first time. Maybe thus far in life you haven't been a Christian able to say that you've got a living faith in Jesus Christ, a real trust in God. But you know that God is calling you to himself. Maybe in the solitude of lockdown, you have heard that call. I encourage you to respond to him in prayer. It might be daunting, it might make you feel vulnerable. It will certainly be costly as it was for Moses, but let me assure you, surrendering to God is the very best decision you could ever make. Maybe you're sensing God calling you to a new vocation or a new ministry. Maybe a new role that you've been thinking about at work or at church in your community. I encourage you to pray with trusted friends and have the courage to explore that call more fully. May this passage today encourage you in your faith this morning. The God of the Bible, who reveals himself as holy, compassionate, the liberator of his people. The awesome truth is that this is the same God, who, the one who called Moses, calls each one of us by name, personally, to share in the adventure of following him. May you be courageous and obedient in following him and responding to him today. Amen. Friends, isn't that brilliant? Weren't you encouraged? It's really good to have a, a bishop who's such a great Bible teacher. I know some of you will have heard her already preach at New Wine in previous years, uh, but I'm thrilled to have her as our bishop here in Horsham. Uh, we're going to pick up on the theme of what she was talking about uh, as we sing our final song this morning at our contemporary service. It's a new song, For the Sake of the World, and it picks up on what Bishop Ruth was talking about, about sensing God's calling in our lives, surrendering all to him, and living for God. At our traditional service, we're going to sing a hymn along a similar theme, picking up on that sense of God's calling and responding to it as we sing the hymn, I the Lord of Sea and Sky. Let's sing.